Hello, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. And welcome to the NAVA Advocacy Program. Oh, and I see a few of us have already joined the chat and letting us know where you are. Please let us know whose country you're on, where you are. Um, say hello as you're, as you're coming in. Uh, oh, hello, Emily Wakeling at Artspace on UWE Country. Nice to see you again. Um, and Anne Stafford, um, he, she is in Bomadere on the South Coast, but saying that she can't can't see anything yet. Also, Kimberly Summer um, on Wurundjeri land. Um, is anyone else having trouble seeing us? I can see and hear and can see the chat just fine. Um, let us know in the chat if um, uh, it's looking good. Okay, Kimberly can see us both. This is good. This is this is a an important step forward. And I hope this is going to clear up for you. Uh, and I see a few people joining the chat and and uh, letting us know where you are. Um, the NAVA Advocacy Program has been going for a good few weeks now, and we have had some really uh, fantastic conversations. Uh, this, of course, is about working together to skill up our advocacy approaches, not just um, as a one-off thing in a time of emergency, but in an ongoing way that keeps us engaged with some big picture questions. Um, before I introduce Adam, please note a few things. First of all, um, as ever, our session today is recorded and it is also being live captioned. Hello to Helen again, our captioner who is in Brisbane. You should see up the top of the chat there, there is the link to the live captioning, which is pinned there. And Leah has just posted it above there as well. Super handy for seeing our words appear on the screen for when it's um, not clear uh, or the sound um, isn't great. So um, if that's helpful for you, click on that link and, um, oh, thank you, Leah, there it is again. And hello to Leah, our uh, Advocacy and Communications Manager, who is also joining us. Um, now, the advocacy program, of course, is leading up to Arts Day on the Hill, our National Day of Advocacy for the Arts. And after our hour conversation with, with Adam, we're going to talk some more about that in the half hour workshop part that, that, that we've got um, left because there's lots to talk about there. And, um, and of course, um, given the events of the last week, the changes to our to some of our lives, the concerns for our neighbours, and then the broader arts and cultural issues. We have lots and lots to talk about. Uh, hello to Kate Smith on Gunnawal Country. Um, oh, and does that mean you can now uh, see us? Was it Anne who couldn't see? I'm just scrolling back up. Uh, Anne can now see. Oh, good. Good, good, because seeing is definitely advantageous because um, you've got Adam's office there looking really great, I must say. We've got some posters there. We've got some kind of urn. Um, everyone, please join me in welcoming Adam Bant. Adam is the member for Melbourne. Um, he is um, a, a, a Greens MP, been a member of the Greens for the time, the leader of the Greens. Um, he is also the former um, spokesperson for the arts and is the co-chair of the Parliamentary Friendship Group for Contemporary Arts and Culture and is also my local member. Adam, welcome. Hi Esther, thanks for having me. Oh, it's good to see you again. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, we have had some great conversations about the arts and other issues over the years and so it's great to be able to, to share these with everyone today. Now Adam, to start off with, just tell us a bit about um, where arts policy um, and I guess an interest and a commitment to the arts sits for the Greens at the moment. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, we've been uh, like everyone else, just sort of putting everything on hold to deal with the coronavirus crisis. I think the whole country's done that and especially in Victoria, we're having to do it again. And in that, one of the things that we've been um, uh, conscious of putting at the forefront of not only the response to or the relief I guess the uh, making sure that everyone is looked after as we go through the crisis but also the response to where how we as a community get out of it um, that we put arts at, at the uh, forefront of that and um, there's we might talk sort of during uh, this this 
talk today, this chat today about some of the particular issues that have been faced and how we might um, get politicians to take a bit more action to uh, not only provide greater relief but also make art central to any recovery package that comes out uh, on the other side of this crisis. Um, but so for us, it's been something that we've been that has been very much at the centre of our thinking, and um, we've. We, we would like to say that we've led the charge in Parliament to ensure that um, people continue to think about arts and the creative sectors in that relief and also in that response. Um, more broadly, I, I think that um, for us, we feel pretty proud about the policies that we've taken to every election and that we continue to take that are about uh, understanding the needs of the arts and creative communities in Australia and uh, things from providing greater security for people who work in the sector, like understanding the particular needs of people who and the insecurity that a lot of people face that I think in, in many respects has, is um, part, you know, part and parcel is an unfair way of putting it, but there's always been a sense in which there's some form of precariousness involved in some forms of work in the arts and creative sectors. But as there's been a general rise in job insecurity for everyone generally, that's really turned up the dial for people who work um, in the arts and creative sectors. So we've been, um, from election after election, uh, putting forward policies that are about making life more secure for people uh, who work in the arts. And that's not just about in increasing levels of funding and making that funding more secure, which is something that we want to, we, we, continually pushed for, but also making sure that artists have that kind of, I guess, wraparound support and exist in a more secure ecology, um, because that is going to be absolutely critical. We've also, um, uh, I guess, have a bit of a worry about the rising, you mentioned, um, uh, we're chatting before about particular MPs on the conservative side who like to chime in every now and then and um, they find one particular artwork or one particular opinion that's expressed and use it as a um, uh, as a cudgel to then try and advance a broader issue. And I think in the context of the changes that we're seeing to universities at the moment, where we're now seeing an explicit shift to saying universities have to be about getting people a job and a, a particular kind of job um, is in the government's mind. And as they're, they're talking about massively increasing the cost for uh, humanities degrees in particular, um, I, I think there's, for us, it's a time to say, no, look, actually, we've got to have a bit of a think about the role of arts and creativity in our society, in our culture, and yes, in our economy, but I'm not one who thinks that we've got to put that right up the top. There's, there are some things that are more important than that. Um, and now I think more than ever, it's important to uh, ensure that we have a well-resourced and secure and prioritised arts and creative sector. Well, goodness me, can I say, first of all, it's a good thing we're recording these because the way that you've just articulated that um, is, is so comprehensive and spot on in terms of um, uh, the key issues, the key issues at this time, but also the ways in which the work of artists and the creative economy more broadly um, powers, um, you know, the broader Australian economy, as well as the way that we live and work and engage with each other. Um, there's a lot of issues to touch on there. Let's pick up first of all about precariousness and, um, you know, what is often, um, I guess, uh, repurposed, reappropriate or glamorised as flexibility. You know, we've spoken a fair bit about how artists are the inventors of the portfolio career or the gig economy and that there are certainly really great advantages mm. to being able to yourself be in control of the conditions in which you work, uh, you know, the modes, the hours and so on. But of course, what's happened across the broader economy is that um, basic elements of job security, income security um, have um, vanished away um, and have tended to then be um, co-opted with that language of um, choice, flexibility, you know, a kind of glamorization of not having those rights. So. Um, how, in, in what ways can a focus on arts or cultural policy and the way in which creative people work, how can that kind of focus strengthen workers' rights for everyone? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think in um, uh, Australia, we're pretty bad in global terms when it comes to job insecurity. We've got 
40% of people in the workforce not in um, what we call an ongoing secure job, so one where you've got all the basic rights of annual leave and so on and where it doesn't end at a particular time and you're not casual. So that that's um, 40% of people are in some form of insecure work in this country. And we've kind of, um, in many sectors, become a, a, a casual work or insecure work has become the norm rather than the exception. Now, what's happened side by side with that is that the other support, sort of the general level of income support that might exist through social security payments or other forms of payment has also been eaten away. And so what it's meant is that, um, the, I mean, many, many uh, people who work in the art sector, especially if you're starting out uh, sort of in an early stage, will be doing other forms of paid work to supplement um, artistic practice and might be making some money from artistic practice. But certainly for many people, it's not it's not going to provide a living income. It's um, uh, not not wholly and certainly not for many people at the early stages. And so those other forms of work that people or income support that people might dip into have just been chipped away at for, um, for many decades. And so that then makes things much, much more insecure. What I think we need to do, though, is there's a number of shifts that we could make that would make uh, a, a big difference. And looking at, as you say, the, the way um, the creative... Uh, process and what that means in terms of being able to have time to reflect on your work and um, I guess perfect your skills in a way that doesn't immediately turn into money and it might not be formal training but is nonetheless going to contribute to your artistic practice. What I think we've got to do is get better in the country of finding ways of rewarding that and acknowledging that. So one simple thing that we could start to do for example would be to allow artistic work to be uh, counted towards the activity test for the purposes of unemployment benefits, for example. So you don't, so that when you're doing something that is about perfecting your practice or improving your practice, um, that's that's recognised as having a benefit. And so you don't need to do that and then go out and, and look for 500 jobs that aren't there, but that is counted towards the work that you do. And I think secondly, um, what we need to be looking at is guaranteed income in this country for, so yeah. that, so that people don't fall below a certain level of income. And we've seen in the corona times the upping, like that doubling of the level of new start is an implicit admission that it was never enough to live on in the first place. And I think we've got to have a big push to keep it where it is so that um, because the cost of living isn't going to suddenly halve in September. But so I think if we can keep it where it is, and I guess thirdly in the workspace, I think we do need some law changes in this country. Um, so that instead of casual and insecure work being the presumption, it becomes the exception again. And again, like it's like for people who work on projects and might work on a particular um, performance that's being put on, yeah, it might be a few months' work at a time or a year's work at a time. So it's not going to be, you can't say blanket across the whole spectrum. Everything has to be a, a year-to-year ongoing job. But we can do a fair bit of reining in I think the uh, the uncertainty by changing the legal presumptions around that. Such important points. I mean, this notion that um, um, you know security of of labour and, and employment is is not the default uh, is is of massive concern, and certainly in changes to. Um, uh, various, you know, uh, aspects of workplace legislation in, in in more recent years that that has very much become the case. And as you say, this 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 mission that um, even when we look at education and um, you know the changes that were announced around the funding of university degrees, this notion that we should focus on um, job readiness, um, you know, this uh, that changes were announced in terms of well, you know, we need to plan for jobs of the future. Um, but of course, as we know, um, our graduates, humanities graduates have a very high employment rate. Um, they are skills that are about uh, the critical approach, a critique, uh, ethical thinking, complex judgment. Um, uh, we discussed many times over the weeks that, of course, um, uh, global studies, including the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, show that the, the top skill set needed for the new economy is actually creativity. Um, and so part of the um, conversation we've been having across this period um, in our program, we're looking at some of the issues that 
are important to advocate for in the arts, some of the uh, ways in which they get captured or not by current policy, uh, and in the last few weeks, some of the ways in which they are engaged with or not in the media. Um, so if we look now at the, those places where advocacy plays out in the media, in, in also the, the um, political and collegiate conversations that, that, that you have, Adam, um, where are we, what are the, what are the gaps? What are the, um, the, the, the blocks? What prevents, um, do you think, a more sophisticated public conversation um, about these kinds of issues when we know that, they, um, that investment and a focus on the arts is great for it's great for the industry, it's great for education, it's great for mental health, it's great for, you know, the, the, that range of things. Where do you see uh, the blocks, the things that prevent um, those ongoing conversations from happening? Yeah, really, really, really good question. And I think, I mean, we can use um, uh, the response to the corona crisis as a, bit, as a bit of an illustrative example to, I think, to, to unpack the, mm, that. Mm. The, we've had um, uh, the, the government... Um, firstly, when it came in with its JobKeeper package, which was really welcome in a lot of places, but if you happen to have patchy work practices and you weren't employed on the magic date of the 1st of March, then you couldn't get JobKeeper. So even though you might have earned an income beforehand and um, found ways of making ends meet, um, working in theatre, for example, like that's there's a lot of people who are in that situation. If you many people, if you weren't employed on the magic date, then they um, they, they weren't going to be eligible. And then separately, there's the fact that the distancing restrictions were a big blow to the business model. Now, um, in that context, like there were other industries that were in a similar situation as well. So aviation, for example, had um, the social distancing requirements has meant that air travel has been virtually grounded. But if you look at the support. Um, given to aviation compared to support given to the arts you wonder well and you look at the employment for example if, if all you cared about was employment um you looked at the employment of the relative sectors you'd wonder well why aren't we giving more support to the arts and i think there's um there's a number of reasons that, that have um in part to do with advocacy but perhaps not advocacy as traditionally understood in a sense the um i think the the government i think has made just a pretty hard-headed decision that they um, are only going to save certain areas and that other people, I think, where uh, other sectors perhaps where they think um, people aren't likely to vote for them or people are used to living on low incomes anyway, we're just not going to give you the support that we're giving to other sectors and we'll just cop it. If there's any public blowback, we'll just we'll just cop it. And um, it's the same with so with arts policy more generally going to elections. I think um, they think, certainly on the conservative side of politics, they think, well, what's in it for us? Why would we bother having a... Um, a good arts policy. Um, a lot of these people either aren't going to vote for us anyway, or the ones that do will, um, uh, they're perhaps participating in some of the, the tier one organisations that are going to be guaranteed funding. And so we don't need to worry too much about thinking about a, a proper policy for funding um, down to some of the other organisations. And I think the, um, uh, the it's, the, it's the, the old adage, though, I think, of the uh, squeaky wheel gets the grease. And if you're com coming back to the aviation example, they knew that the airlines had access to the national media and were able to come out and say, hey, the government's about to let us go under. And um, so I think out of fear of knowing that there were some well-resourced players there who could have run quite a powerful campaign against the government, they supported them. And um, I think one of the things that we need to get a handle on in... Um, arts and in arts advocacy in particular is to be blunt um, how to make politicians feel that they might suffer some electoral pain if they don't pay attention to the arts. And, you know, to let you in on a trade secret, politicians care about votes and they care about winning seats and they and, and care about losing seats. And um, what the, the, the others, you know, the budget is um, of a certain size and there are some very loud voices demanding slices of that budget. And what they do is they go to politicians and they say, look, if you don't give us a tax break or if you don't give us the funding or give us the support, then we're in a position to go and run campaigns to ensure you get less votes and potentially less seats and potentially lose or don't, don't gain government. Um, 
and I think we've got to work out how um, it might not might not be a, a way of thinking that people are necessarily used to, but I think we've got to work out what is the arts equivalent of that? Like, what is the arts equivalent of being able of politicians getting politicians so terrified that they start thinking about the arts budget the way they think about the defence budget? It's like we never we would never cut it because we know we're going to lose votes and we we know we're going to lose seats. And I think in that respect. Um, it's not always about uh, um, uh, necessarily explaining the economic benefit, although that is critical that they understand that. I think it's often about making them feel like, oh, if I don't come up with a good arts policy, then there might be a bunch of people who live in my electorate who aren't going to vote for me. Or um, the thing that re they really care about as politicians is around public image. And if there's a sense that um, there might all of a sudden be a, a publicity campaign or an advertising campaign run against my party, um, that all of a sudden people are going to start seeing faces that they've recognised from their theatre or their TV screens or whatever, that's when I think um, they're potentially going to start paying attention. So I think we need to think about how to turn the dial up and turn arts advocacy from as well as being advocacy, like to actually being a form of campaigning in the way that the others do it. I think it's um, it's such a crucial point. So you just mentioned a few different aspects. You mentioned earlier about advocacy, not in the traditional way, but thinking about things differently. Advocacy in terms of um, um, creating that feeling of terror <laughs> that votes could be lost. Um, and then that sense of, um, of a, a clear public message that you know it like makes it very clearly about electoral issues. Um, have we just been kind of too nice, too um, uh, distributed, too unfocused? Um, what's um, what are the kinds of arts conversations that people have when they when they come and meet with you? Uh, and, and the kinds of you know how would you you know let's like be be, be entirely blunt how, how would you compare I guess um, the conversations in and and the approaches compared to when people from other industries approach you, knowing also that some of those other industries have paid lobbyists who's, yeah. who, you know, that's what they do for a living. How, how does it, how does that compare? Yeah, so it's it's a um, tricky comparison to make because, I mean, I, I, we feel like that part of our role in as the Greens in Parliament is we're advocating for the public interest as opposed to particular vested interests. And so, um, mm. I mean, to take take another example, um, uh, in the transport field, everyone knows that public transport is the way to reduce congestion and a better way of doing it than building more roads. But the roads lobby has got a lot of money behind it, whereas who's out there actually advocating for public transport? It's people who want to do it because they know that that it's academics who know it's the right thing and there's yeah. some users, but there's not the same level of money behind it. So it's this, this bigger question about how do you advocate for something that's in the public interest um, and knowing, like as arts is, how do you advocate for something that's in the public interest knowing that there's not going to be the big money behind it? And I think the... the um, so it's hard to compare the two, but I think one thing that's worth thinking about is what are the what are the what are the strengths of the arts and creative community that the others don't have like yep the others might have money but that only takes you so far right if the game is to um or if the if the aim rather is to have a politician think oh if, if i don't do this thing that's being proposed it might actually risk my seat how does that happen and i mean um, again, one of the strengths in the arts and visual arts um, communities in particular is the creativity, I think, right? And uh, the, the, you've got the capacity, I think, to generate things that um, can become front page news, that can become uh, images that get uh, refracted around the world, around the country and around the world. And you've got access to people who are... Um, known faces that might be you know popping up on tv screens or um or in other forms or um uh, uh, that are otherwise well-known um, names and identities that would send terror down um a marginal seat backbenchers spine if they thought oh my goodness is there going to be 
um, ads run or creative ads are run or something that um, is put out there that suddenly captures public imagination and is shared widely on mm. you know, on forms of social media. Um, that is the kind of thing that they'll say, oh, well, I'd rather that campaign not be run against me. And so if what you're asking for is um, just a well-funded arts policy, then I'll give you a well-funded arts policy rather than have that kind of creative campaign run against me. So I would guess, I guess I would say to people, um, um, you, it, you won't be able to match it on the spending side with the mining companies who come in and say, give us a tax deduction, otherwise we're going to turf you out of this particular seat um, in, in Queensland or Western Australia or wherever it is. But you can probably better them on creativity. And I think that's something that, um, that, that can capture ten attention and send shivers down their spine. And if we can't catch them on creativity, then something's wrong. <laughs> Now we've got a question from the chat from Kimberly Summer. What is the best time to campaign and advocate for the arts in the Australian political calendar? What do you think, Adam? Is there a, is there a good time? Yeah, lead up to budgets and elections uh, and, and by-elections as well, but elections in particular, um, because that's when a lot of them come uh, come knocking and that's, that's a time when politicians are at their most sensitive is during elections and um, that's the that's the classic time I think if you said hey look here's this here's this ad or here's this little clip um, that's about to run about you or your party because you've refused to come up with a good arts policy um, and we're running it in a week like in the middle of an election where you might win or lose by a couple of hundred votes it's at that time that it's um, uh, makes a uh, makes a big difference and I would also say just as a um, <clears throat> so speaking from a bit of a well, speaking from the perspective of being a politician, we get a lot of um, uh, communication into the office and a lot of people wanting our attention and wanting our time. The thing that goes to the top of the pile is actually individual communications and correspondence from someone who lives in the area. And especially, believe it or not, if it's handwritten, um, that goes right to the top of the pile because anyone can click a form email and bang, it's gone in two seconds. But when someone in your electorate has actually said to you, look, here's me in the electorate or here's the school that I work at in the electorate or here's 50 of us who live in your electorate who all feel this passionately about it and we're personally contacting you, that kind of goes to the top of the pile. And again, election times are a good time for that, but that could be done at any time throughout the cycle. These are two very good points that you've just made. First of all, about the timing, obviously, lead up to the election, people are very sensitive and the media are very ready to hear a diverse range of stories. And so they're even more eager to get stuff out there, not just the usual pre-election stories, but also heading into the budget season uh, and the budget preparation season, which is mm -hmm. why Arts Day on the Hill is on the 12th of August, which was typically the first sitting week after the winter break. And then that budget planning starts to happen. Um, but also this... Um, um, yeah, that's some really good advice about how to approach a politician. Um, I was um, presenting a workshop some years ago now with um, the former advisor to the former Premier of Victoria, and she talked about how they had a stamp in the office which would get stamped on correspondence as it came in, and if there was, a, you know, a, a, it was back in the days of, you know, think things being bulk um, uh, tangible as opposed to email. Um, if there was something which was clearly a form letter petition, it would get the stamp, get the tick of, look, you know, don't bother. It would sit in a box for a while and then it would get thrown away. And this was such an insight for everyone in that workshop because people go to such lengths to sort of write petitions and so on, whereas you don't know what personal thought and commitment someone has given to something which is a form letter. But when someone's taken the trouble to, to contact you in a personalised way, that's, you know, yeah, I can see where that would go to the top of the pile. So that takes us to Yvonne East's question who says, Adam, what do you hear all the time but get but, but are bored of hearing from artists? So is there something that... Um, um, are there things that, you know, is, is there perhaps a way in which um, artists communicate um, um, that, um, are there particular things that, that you hear quite often um, and that, you know, you're kind of, you're, you're sick of hearing, you're bored of hearing and perhaps um, you, you want to be hearing something more helpful? Um, not really, no, nothing, and I'm not just saying that to be kind, but there's nothing I can immediately think of that, um, that I think is, 
uh, is boring or is not <laughs> worth hearing. I, I, I guess I'll just come back to my main point that um, there's something that uh, we can do, like, and we, we sometimes do this as the Greens as well when it comes to communicating our policies. Sometimes some of us can have this tendency to think, especially with politicians, if only they had a bit more information or a bit more data, they'd make a better decision. And um, so there's this often this attempt to persuade, well, let me tell you about the rationality of the argument and let me tell you about the facts and the figures and the amount of dollars and so on. And um, what I think is uh, one of the things I think that that misses is that, I mean, human beings don't always make decisions on the basis of rationality or facts. And that's, I think, something that... Um, uh, that the art sector, people who work in the arts and creative sector actually understand and understand really well and understand what, what motivates and what drives um, people and how, you know, and the importance of emotion in particular in, in the way that people are in the world and, and the decisions that people make. And so I think, and it comes back to my point, and I'm sorry if I'm sounding like a stuck record, but about making politicians feel like there's going to be a downside for them if they don't do something in particular, um, is that uh, politicians, like the decisions that I've seen made in Canberra, a lot of them, you just think, where's the rationality in that? Like, why did we just make that? It's not an evidence-based decision. Not everything is always an evidence-based decision. And like, I think that who you, um, the decisions politicians make, just like the decisions about who you vote for, aren't always head decisions. They're often heart decisions or soul decisions or decisions about affects. And so I think probably just um, don't, uh, don't feel that you've always got a um, jump back into that box of thinking, well, if I've got to give them a bit more, give the politicians a bit more evidence and then they'll make a better decision. Yes, it's important. Yes, it's crucial. But there's also other ways to, um, to people's hearts, including politicians. Yeah, I think that issue of hearts and minds, that's something that um, John Alexander spoke about um, when, when he was our guest a few uh, a couple of months ago now in, in, in this session, talking about exactly that. We know there's a yeah, world of great economic and other arguments that, you know, you know that's, that's not yeah, shifting those, those, those hearts and minds. But tell us, though, one of the, I think one of the reasons why um, uh, colleagues are reluctant to um, engage in that way with uh, politicians is because you know of the risk of coming across as though making a threat or uh, mm. risking um, damaging the relationship. You would have had um, you know arranged people come to your office and uh, exactly as you've described, say you know th 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 these are the consequences if if this doesn't happen. What's your advice about that? How do we come across in a really you know clear, firm way um, without risking damaging relationships when we need to? articulate what the consequences are of inaction? Yeah, good question. And I, that's where I think there's strength in numbers. And so mm. I think that um, coming together to do particular things makes it a lot uh, a lot easier. And I think at the end of the day, like you, you, it's not always about um, saying uh, we're going to um, necessarily say vote for a particular, we're, gonna, we're endorsing you as a particular party. It's about saying, this is the policy, this is the yardstick that we're going to measure all parties against, right? And we're going to, here's the things we want, and we're not saying this just because we're pro-Liberal or pro-Labor or pro-Greens, here's the things we want, and we're going to measure everyone objectively against that yardstick. And those who stack up, we're going to tell our members about that and we're going to tell the public about it, and those who don't, we're going to campaign strongly. And I would say that um, you can do that. That doesn't come across as a threat to a politician. It's just like we are, here's our asks, here's what we want, and here's the campaign we're going to run to get them. Um, and we're going to run a really strong campaign and we'll, we'll, um, we'll back anyone who backs our demands and whatever party you're, you come from and we'll say to everyone who doesn't come from, doesn't meet our demands, you've got to do better, whichever party you come from. If it's put in that way, um, then I think uh, people respect that and people understand that. And that's not seen um, as a threat. That's just seen as part and parcel of politics. And I guess the second point I would make is that coming back to that earlier point, 
the other people who are arguing for the parts of the pie don't feel that compunction. <laughs> they're, they're much more prepared to <laughs> yeah. jump in, boots yeah. and all, and say, oh, hang on, you know, give us three these three things or we're out to run a big campaign. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, it, that's good behaviour to copy, but I'm just saying that is what people are up against. And so uh, I think there's, as long as it's seen of um, it, what, what politicians don't want to think is that, well, look, no matter what I do, you're not going to back me or yeah. because you're just tied to one particular party. If they think that, then that's that's when it, um, it becomes harder to be seen as independent. But if you can go, go in there arguing independently, just saying here's our policy asks, then I think people will respect that. Yeah, for sure. And it's just, it's so um, frustrating that notion that um, uh, in the eyes of some in the coalition, um, the um, the arts aren't to vote winner when we know that there are a lot of artists, donors, sponsors, etc., cetera, um, who are committed to um, the coalition and are also donors uh, to the parties. Um, and so, yeah, I think the, the clarity and firmness of, of, of that conversation is crucially important. And it does mean, like, I've seen a few people jump into the chat saying, are we being too polite and so on? And it's like, it's, it does, yeah, well, it's not about saying to be too polite. It, it might involve stepping out of the comfort zone a bit mm. and doing things that, um, saying, oh, yeah, geez, that campaign seems a bit hard hitting. But actually, in such a crowded time when so many people are trying to get your attention and there's so many calls on the money, you kind of have to do something that might make you feel a bit uncomfortable and might be ratcheting it up a bit, mm, but that's mm. the way to get attention, I think. Especially in a media landscape which is decreasing in size and diversity and so it's even more yeah. difficult uh, to seize that front page and so needing to, yeah, to be bold and creative is really important. Now, we've got a question, a couple up there, um, from Anne Accordingly about the Parliamentary Friendship Group for Contemporary Arts and Culture. Um, but as a preface to that, um, let's talk about working across the parliament uh, with colleagues who have shared interest among uh, a, a number of different areas. Tell us about how that works for you and for the Greens. So parliamentary friendship groups are one way of doing that uh, and, and sort of formal if you put their names to things. Um, but how do you currently, uh, as a, you know, as a matter of course of, you know, doing that parliamentary business, um, how do you engage um, across party lines to achieve things? Yeah, so pe there's a lot of informal conversations that go on and people do um, <clears throat> talk uh, uh, often as um, uh, backbenchers, so people will who don't have ministerial roles will be having the discussions about <clears throat> um, what might be a particular fix to a particular problem or a particular useful thing to take up next. And those conversations are important because <clears throat> if you can work out a uh, a way of dealing with something that you know is going to sail through the parliament because everyone's actually done the work of agreeing on it beforehand then it becomes a much easier um, solution to put forward so <clears throat> those discussions take place and that's why things like parliamentary friendship groups uh, are really important like there was a time for example where um excuse me it's there's the work there, was, talking. there was a time in one of um <coughs> There was a time when we didn't have a minister for cities, and the um, <coughs> and the um, we had a parliamentary friendship group for better cities. And one of the things that the group wanted to do was get back a minister and make sure that when the minister came, they had a bunch of um, policy prescriptions ready to go. And it worked really, really well. And we got back a minister for cities, and then. The, the parliamentary friendship group said, great, we've actually done a large part of our work. So that stuff happens and it's important. Great. Um, so the Parliamentary Friendship for Contemporary Arts and Culture, um, we formed, uh, we supported colleagues to form um, uh, and launched at last year's Arts Day on the Hill. So it is still fairly new. And unfortunately, um, Adam couldn't make it that evening. So he wasn't at our launch event. So he's still a committed part of, of the group. Uh, and so the group is still kind of... Um, um, you know, getting going in terms of things to aim for. But what has happened, of course, since that time is the restructure which um, uh, disappeared, vanished the name of the arts from a, um, from a portfolio. Um, how, what are the ways in which the Parliamentary Friendship Group could not just redress that, but really start to look at those, those policy pros? Because it's, a, it's one of the larger friendship groups. There are a lot of MPs in the group across all parties. Um, and some really committed people, I think. 
Yeah, it's it's a, a good question. And again, like the city's example mm. to me shows that it can actually be achieved. And like, you never know when there's going to be a reshuffle in cabinet and like those those are like having the idea ready and pushing it and saying, no, look, next basically you need to get the message to your government and to the Prime Minister that next time there's a reshuffle, we have to put arts back in as a standalone and we'd ideally like it to be a separate minister or, you know, it's a standalone portfolio, if not at least mentioned as a name. Um, the time outside of, like the time to get ready for all of those things is now and the time to have those discussions is now and be clear about what it is that people are asking for so that when the opportunity comes, um, bang, you can um, lay it on the table and it might happen again. And there was the city's example. We also lost a minister for science a while ago and um, under the Abbott government and we sort of pushed and pushed and eventually got the minister for science back as well. And so I think um, we do have a minister, but we don't have it in the department name, but being able to say, look, we've got, this is what we want. Um, this is part of re-elevating it back to an important point in policy making. It's good for people to know that and um, so that people are ready when the opportunity arises. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, just asking everyone for more questions for Adam, because we've got about, or just around, just under 20 minutes left with Adam, and then we'll go into more of our workshop conversation. Let's... Um, go back to the conversation about um, the media and securing that focus and also um, to, to continue the conversation from last week about the politicisation, the, the politicised response to Abdul Abdullah's work. Um, when MPs do something like that, it can be very difficult for an artist to know how to respond. And in the chat we were having earlier, just before we flick the big record switch, um, Adam and Leo and I were uh, just realising that last week when we spoke about um, Abdul's work, um, I neglected to mention um, a key element of that story, which is that um, the politicians, George Christensen and Martin Bella, the local councillor, in choosing to um, uh, politicise their response to Abdul's work, they chose to do so around Remembrance Day, the 11th of November last year, knowing that um, Abdul and certainly nobody from, from the gallery or from the arts was going to make any kind of response on Remembrance Day. It is uh, when you also look at the way that um, um, uh, returned service people, their families and others, when you look at the way that um, their, um, uh, you know, their emotional state on that day was exploited, it really strikes me as an incredibly... Um, uh, callous thing to have done. How difficult is it, Adam, in a situation like that where um, to make a strong response around an issue that, that it's about, that is about um, um, artists and war on, on a day like that, um, how on earth do you respond as a politician when you know that you've been wedged mm -hmm. in a corner uh, on something that is so crucial and requires a response? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky and it's um, there's a reason that they continue to mount those kind of attacks on that side of politics, and it's the same way that they get up. Um, I said you, you hear them late night in the chamber, and it's usually around the time that um, grant ARC grants are awarded, uh, and they yes. get up and they'll read out yeah. a list of um, things, and they'll find half a dozen titles that they think. Uh, um, uh, some somehow uh, extraordinary that this that this kind of research would be funded, and they get out and they read the title out of context, and then they try and get a media story up in some of the sensationalist media about it, and why are we funding this? And worryingly, we saw the education minister not that long ago step in and actually veto a few grants um, again, kind of on the basis of the um, the sensational what they thought was sensational nature of the titles, but to me is. Um, someone who's been through um, uh, that uh, tertiary education and, and um, postgraduate study, it's like, well, yes, I mean, you, you can, you, you probably, have you actually read the person's work? Do you actually understand whether there's a gap in the field that that person is contributing to? We might have the world expert in that particular area and you're just getting up and making a cheap shot. Um, and I, th I think it's getting worse. And I think that there's um, the, the, uh, it's the kind of thing that governments do when they think they're in trouble on other fronts as they are at the moment in the, with the economy 
um, tanking uh, and us in recession, if not in depression, I think we can potentially expect to see this kind of culture war dial being turned up even a bit further, which is a bit of a, a bit of a concern. I guess I would say two things. When it happens, firstly, know that there's um, advocates that you've got in Parliament who will speak out against it. And so let us know, get in touch and say, hey, hang on, this I've just been attacked for this and um, they've completely misconstrued my work or it's an unfair attack to make and so on so that we know, so that we can get up and raise it in response. I guess the second thing I would say is that we've got a particularly unique opportunity at the moment where, um, you know, the mining boom having come to an end and the money starting to have run out, it seems that uh, uh, the Australian government is being um, more willing to step up against uh, and raise concerns, including human rights and democratic expression concerns in places like China and is focus on what's happening in Hong Kong and a focus on what's happening in China. And I think um, we've got now, and it's amazing how the people who get up and make these kind of attacks are also often the biggest warriors for so-called free speech. And I think we've got a really golden opportunity now to turn around and call them out for what they are and say, hang on, you're basically saying that um, it's the role of government to say that certain kinds of artistic practices should not be allowed because you disagree with them. Didn't you just two breaths ago just exactly condemn that um, in another government overseas? And I think it's time for us to start calling them out for that, what I think is rank hypocrisy. And I think that kind of attack might have a bit more purchase, that counter attack might have a bit more purchase now. That's a, that's a great approach. Um, and especially when um, we know that, um, you know, so we're jumping on something which is an issue, the media thinking about those, those, you know, those structural frameworks for advocacy is about continuing a story. The media are always motivated to continue a story which is already in the news um, and yeah, to really dial that up. I think that that's a really good one. Now we've got a number of questions coming in. First of all, Nadia Odlam says, um, do you think there's a potential for the arts to team up with other industries to better lobby government. Um, and Michaela Nutt's adding to that saying, she's always thought the arts versus sport argument was unproductive and that a joint approach about the two sectors, societal benefits, the physical and mental well-being, the visit to economy, apprenticeship skills potential. They're trying that there locally over in Luton in the UK, but it's hard to get off the ground. And Michaela, uh, who is a former resident of Melbourne, um, um, you, I, I don't know if you've been following, Michaela, the uh, approach um, of the Victorian government in their COVID-19 package for uh, the arts, which they have called the, the visitor economy. Um, and it's, it is about art, sport, culture, the whole kind of piece. But yeah, what do you think, Adam? Who are the industries we should be teaming up with? Yeah, it's a good, it's a, it's a really good question. I think one of the things that um, I, I, I've made the point that before that, when lobbying politicians, when making the case, um, we we can't just focus on the economic side of it. We have to focus on the other, the other, like argue for it for its inherent worth as well, because um, uh, that's like that's a that's a crucial way of defending the place. But on the other hand, like the, the, I guess the, I'd complement that argument by saying making the point that Michaela and others are making, which is that I think um, people probably people often have a misunderstanding of what the real economy and society actually looks like. And so if you ask people, are there more people employed in the arts or in mining? You know, people people have got an inflated idea because mining has been so good, for example, I'm, and I'm just picking them out because they've been a very good self promoter at yeah. sort of explaining to uh, creating this sense of how important they are to the economy. Um, and so I think, uh, yes, like any project that actually says, here's how integral the um, uh, arts and creative sector is to the economy. And like, I, I feel that in Melbourne and like, we've been having discussions about how does the how does the comedy festival ever happen again in this time of restrictions or, you know, like these, there's these real questions of these things that are so important to our everyday activity. And what's the flow on effect of that for tourism? What's the flow on effect of that for the shops? And we're sort of, we're starting to see that. So there is um, absolutely, when you think about the real place of arts and creative in sector in the economy and thinking about the others that hang off that, yeah, partnering with um, tourism was mentioned, partnering with those others that hang off it. Like, and again, sport, like that, that, that suggests that talk about that Victoria is the visitor economy. Like, yeah, I think that's a really, really um, good idea. And 
I would also say have a think about other um, uh, sectors like like science as well. Like I think it's I, I've been the science spokesperson for us for a while. I'm not anymore, but I have been for a long time. And there was to me, I noticed a lot of similarities between what I was hearing when scientists were coming in and lobbying me um, at, at the same time as artists and mm. the and people in the creative sector. There was this real sense of like we're doing our work really in a way I'm focused on a particular bit and a particular thing that I'm interested in but it's as part of a contribution to our general understanding of what, who we are in the world and what what we're doing and um, I'd prefer to be able to just spend my time getting on with my particular creative project but I understand that I've got to engage in this lobbying world and so on um, but how do we get a better slice of the pie and some of the questions that that have come out through this are exactly the same questions that are asked at, there's a science meets parliament um, process that goes on as well and uh, every year and I go to that and these are very very similar questions that are that are coming out and scientists and researchers saying oh, I'm worried about you know my grant funding and should I step out and make you know stick my head above the parapet and so on and I say to them what I say to you which is that firstly there are others who are arguing louder for that particular slice of the pie but secondly I think one point that um, probably have I haven't made enough during this conversation is that there is a I think um, notwithstanding what George Christensen will say when he gets up in Parliament I think there's a really strong um, uh, uh, residual and, and hard to budge affection in Australia for the arts and you, that, people might, that might seem a bit counterintuitive but it's a bit like the way there is for science as well like people love the idea um, and it might maybe it's a version of what others have called cultural cringe I don't know but uh, that people love the idea that we're actually able we've got people who produce things that are valued by the society and valued by the rest of the world and whether that's in science or the arts I think there's a really strong sense that hey this is us being a smart creative country and we've got to back it and I think that it's it's a way if there's other sectors that we can jump tap into to say hey this is a version of and I'm pitching someone else's policy but Australia uh, policy name but Australia is a creative nation like that kind of creativity being at the core of what we do I think it's a it's something that the population really um, is ready to accept and uh, so and I think there's a lot of potential partners for the arts in that project it's such a good point and it's something that we've touched on a lot in the recent weeks is all the different competing um, cliches and stereotypes around the arts like it's it's elitist it's not me oh it is kind of you know it's it, it's every day it's every day um, craft it's community connection oh um, artists are you know um, uh, fringe um, you know they should go and get a job oh no artists are slackers artists are rich artists support like, there's so many different kind of cliches um, and as um, Alex Martin was pointing out a, a bit earlier uh, that challenge of well you know sh do you emphasize critical thinking and creativity when you're advocating or is that a turn-off um, but I think you're right Adam that um, you know we think about um, um, the CSIRO and the ABC for example as, 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 as critical cultural institutions and the way that we spring to their defense but maybe it's about you know how do we um, um, advocate for how do we have a conversation around those critical um, intellectual um, uh, creative and scientific pursuits without it sounding elite or inaccessible yeah well one of the um uh, I, I think those two institutions, are, like, they're, they're exactly the institutions I had in mind when talking about science, like people love the CSIRO and people think, like, love to hear things that have been invented here or the work that's being done. There's a really strong level of support just as there is um, for the ABC. So I think questions about how the um, leverage off that are really uh, crucially important. One other thing I think coming out of the um, corona crisis and the economic crisis that we we're in at the moment is that um, I mean things things on the jobs front weren't great for many people before corona yeah. started we yeah. have four in ten young we have three in ten young people um, 
either or in fact uh, yeah three and ten um either without a job or without enough hours of work so underemployed or insecure work that number's gone up to four out of ten and it's potentially gonna stay high for a while as a lot of these industries potentially can't restart in the same way or certainly can't restart for a long time and i think um one of one of the things that's in our mind is you look back to the response from the US government 100 years ago with the um, around 100 years ago to the Great Depression when they had the New Deal. And there was a, a yes out of that. And that was like, we've got a lot of people out of work. We've got a lot of things the country needs. Let's put two and two together and have a government led recovery that makes it happen. And is they got massive transport infrastructures out infrastructure out of it. They got the National Park Service out of it, all of which America still enjoys today. But there was a huge artistic and, and cultural component to the New Deal recovery as well. And um, that's often perhaps not, not widely understood about how significant that was. And um, I think we've got a bit of an opportunity here in Australia to do something similar. So we're advocating, for example, a program of having um, uh, artists in residence in schools as part of the recovery package where you would you would um, employ someone to go and spend some time in schools and um, use use their time to learn from the students but also impart their skills on the students and engage in artistic practices together and as well as the other bigger packages for um, telling our own stories and for um, uh, in supporting the arts and the creative sector more generally I think there's um, uh, now a real chance to jump in and say, well, what about some, it's it's a way of, I, th I think it's probably a, a different way of talking about the economic benefits of it, but in a way that perhaps grounds it a bit more. It's like, oh yeah, okay, let's, let's have some, I, I think having an artist in my kid's school would be a good idea or um, having something like, let's, let's use this as an opportunity to say, we've got to reinvigorate community grassroots arts organisations yeah. and grassroots practices and once we can start making that practical and saying this is going to be about getting some jobs for the people who are otherwise going to be unemployed potentially for a year or so as we head out of the corona crisis that is another way i think of making it more tangible and engaging that um, support that people have for arts and really making it like relocalizing it in terms of the benefits to you immediately in your community or in your educational institutions oh god yeah i mean that's it, it, it it's nation building uh, it is clearly nation building stuff. I think that's exactly, that is exactly what's needed. Now, I'm just looking at the time and I'm also looking at the chats and there is one more question, but Adam, have you got time for one more question? One more, great. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so Kimberly Summer is asking about advocacy um, for when we're talking about people who are um, in groups that tend to be targeted by the media uh, and, and becoming more vulnerable when, when they do speak up. So Kimberly says, many people I try to advocate for feel they can't do so because they're typically targeted by the media, such as former refugees, Sudanese community. What can we do to fight for them, for their arts-based practices, without putting them in danger of more targeting and trauma? And for those of us in Melbourne, this is a very current question right now uh, because um, uh, we know that in those um, nine social housing communities, um, there are not only a lot of artists, but there are a lot of people in communities for whom a range of artistic and cultural expression is absolutely crucial to everyday life. And that is being very constrained at the moment. Uh, we'd love to be able to advocate for people without necessarily speaking on their behalf or purporting to, um, but then we don't want to expose them to further attack. I think that's a really uh, important question, Kimberly. Adam, what's your advice on that? That's a, yeah, it's a really okay. good. It's a really good question, and uh, I think there's. Um, I think it depends who you're trying to convince, and I think there's on the one hand there are um, a group of people who want to want to hear those stories about what um, uh, the practices that people are engaged in and the work that they're doing, in, including any challenges that they're having from funding cuts and so on. They people There's a group of people who really want to hear that because um, they know about the importance of uh, the arts and are concerned and so want to hear because they're concerned. If you're talking to the, the, the um, a broader group of people who perhaps might you might think aren't necessarily going to be sympathetic might this might turn into something that's targeting and so on i mean one of the things that i i think is um uh undeniable is the the role of i guess community um grassroots 
uh, artistic practices and social cohesion. And I just think it's, uh, it's, it's I see it as a local member um, all the time and like it's the fine, people talk about Australia being a multicultural society and isn't it good that we don't have some of the tensions that other countries have and query whether we do or not, because perhaps sometimes that's just being swept under the carpet. But um, what um, what you do see is that it's like it's it's um, it's an enormously um, uh, uh, important way of people feeling like they're engaged and like they're human beings and that they belong and. Um, that that fine grained work when we talk about multiculturalism that is what makes a society a multicultural society socially cohesive and so I would be stressing to others and you're going to have a lot of advocates here who um, whether or not they support a particular artistic grant being given out want to see a socially cohesive community and so will therefore back projects if um, the evidence can show this is a really good way of keeping people engaged when the alternative is disengagement. And um, I think that is something I, I see it every day. I see the value of it every day, but I think a lot of people don't. And um, when you start saying, if you, you pull these things out, then um, what else, how else are people going to spend their time? What are they going to do? Isn't this, isn't it, isn't it great to have people here um, in a recording studio composing music or um, painting or sitting on a computer working out how to do animation? Like, isn't that a really good thing? Isn't that better than the alternative? The answer's got to be yes. And so that's how I'd get that message out to some of the decision makers on that front. That is such a good way of putting it. Thank you, Adam. Now, before we um, we all um, uh, thank Adam in that strange chat way that, that, that we do, um, I just want to recognise um, the important role of Senator Sarah Hanson Young as the Green spokesperson for the arts. She has been going out of her way to stay connected with and, and hearing from the industry at this time. Um, I was in Canberra last week to speak at um, the parliamentary inquiry into the Australian government's a COVID-19 response and Senator Hanson Young had some really forensic questions to ask um, of, of, of me and a, a range of us that, that whole afternoon. And in general, as, as Adam was saying towards the beginning of our chat, um, the position that the Greens have been taking through this period, but also for, uh, you know, across all the years uh, that you have been together um, on the arts has been clear and consistent um, and is valued and appreciated by everyone. And certainly in the years that we've known each other, Adam, I've always deeply appreciated our chats and your time very much today. So everyone, please join me in thanking Adam. We're going to stick around for another half hour for our workshop part. Uh, but Adam, thank you so, so much. You know, some great challenges and kicks in the bum there. Straight. Thanks very much. It's to see everyone. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thanks, Adam. Bye. Oh, such good questions and provocations. And I am just um, going back on some of the questions that um, that, that people have asked. Um, so we can now address this and look at what we've just learned from today, but also getting into um, our, our advocacy lessons and plans heading into Arts Day on the Hill. My first question for everyone um, is, now we've just had three politicians speak to us. We've had John Alexander from the Liberal Party. We've had Maria Van Bakuno from Labor. We've had Adam Bant from the Greens. What are some of the different techniques that you have just seen in these three, particularly those who've been here for all of those three sessions? How, how have they just demonstrated to you um, their skill in being a politician? In what ways um, have they... Um, uh, engaged with us and how have they done that um, differently? So in, in, in what, what, what have you just been learning in terms of the techniques that they've used to engage with us as politicians? And while everyone's thinking of a response to that, I'm just going to go back to Mary Findlay, Findlay's question um, about um, do you think we should be working at a state level and lobbying our federal members, a small regional art gallery, physically isolated uh, and geographically, arts bring so much to communities by well-being and economically, it's very frustrating not to be recognised at a federal level when it is so important. 100% um, Mary, and I have to say, your being physically or ge um, geographically isolated um, is in fact um, um, 
precisely the reason why engaging with your um, federal politicians is so important um, and, and senators as well. It's not just your local member, but all the senators in your state. Um, um, they are always very, very eager to hear from regional communities um, and building that relationship for all the reasons we've been uh, discussing throughout this program is super important. So a relationship that you form, a conversation that you have around the issues for you and your community um, are then picked up uh, when industry bodies um, such as mine or Alex Marston is on the chat with us, the uh, program, the, the National Director of uh, the Australian Museums and Galleries Association, when we then go and meet with MPs and they're able to say to us, oh, actually, you know, it's interesting you should say that because Mary Findlay uh, just got in touch with me recently and she shared this experience. So that's that, that thing we all need to do to keep those conversations going. So the techniques that we have just been witnessing um, from politicians and Louise Rollman says their knowledge regarding the arts is really different. Um, and of course, um, we have Adam who was the green spokesperson for the arts and is also the member for Melbourne. Uh, and so uh, there's no way that Adam could have won his seat, let alone be successful as a local politician without being very engaged in the arts. And I think in terms of the other two politicians that we've heard from what's instructive there is that it's a lot more typical of a typical MP. So what's the language we need to use? You know, JA obviously is a former um, uh, elite tennis player, was drawing on his experience in that area. Uh, Maria um, has a, a social... Um, uh, social and activism and, 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 and so on background, was very interested in, in uh, social connections, cultural diversity uh, and those aspects of the arts. Um, and so part of the purpose, there's been a few questions about the Parliamentary Friendship Group and what do they do. Um, part of it is, um, so the, the way that Parliamentary Friendship Groups work is, as Adam was explaining, um, it connects people across the Parliament who has shared interests uh, they are registered with the Speaker of the House. They're listed on the Australian Parliament website and they only exist for a single term um, of government. And they can do things, they can request things, they can um, access resources, you know, that, that, that we can't access. And if Arch Down the Hill was going to go ahead in Canberra this year, which is, of course is not possible, um, we would have had an event which they hosted and, and, um, and so on. What we're doing at the moment is um, um, out of John Alexander's office, we've um, developed that survey that we discussed some weeks ago to understand what their engagement is, what they know of the arts in their electorate, whose work is hanging on their walls so that we can then use that rich information uh, to connect more effectively with them um, on Arts Downey Hill, but also to mobilise them as internal advocates across the whole parliament. Um, Anne Stafford says that in the electorate of Indi, the model of kitchen table conversations might be a way of engaging politicians. Perhaps it's been very successful and is a non-threatening but extremely informative way of conveying information. And tell us more about the kitchen table conversations. It's um, There have been so many different modes of meeting at this time because we can't meet face to face. Um, but as many people have been saying and also during our program, it makes um, a range of things more accessible. You can, um, you know, as, a, as an outcome of this, it's going to become normal to be able to get in touch with your MP and ask for a video meeting without having to travel, who knows how far it might be, especially if you're regionally, to get to their office. Um, you know, we need to continue these, these ways of meeting, but also it's certainly gathering around a kitchen table is a very practical, honest way of having a good conversation, which is why I've stressed as well, inviting MPs to your studio, to your gallery, but in particular to the place where you make work. People love um, it being explained to them, you know, how did you make this? You know, here you go. That's those, um, those deep insights are so valuable for politicians. And I have multiple stories of then hearing MPs tell others for years and years, you know, I, I was invited to this artist studio and I, and I saw this and this is how they do that. Um, Nadia Oblum is saying, 
Adam definitely seems to understand the arts and its needs more than John Alexander, but both gave useful tips on how to actually get politicians' attention. For example, getting to know them, then appealing to their interests, J.A. said, or the types of communication methods such as handwritten letters or developing campaigns around election time. But it was great to hear them both speak and remember that politicians are actual people. That, of course, Nadia is one of the hidden agendas of this program is that um, so often... Um, um, and I know in conversations I have, not just with, um, you know, colleagues and uh, artists professionally, but also with, um, with friends and neighbours, people feel intimidated about the idea of speaking with a politician or arranging to meet with them or sidling up at an event. But, you know, we elected them and we're paying their salaries. Their job is to listen to us. So we've really got to put that aside um, and, and build those relationships because they really are actual people like us. Um, yeah, that's hugely, hugely important. And so those tips around how to get politicians' attention, um, the different tips that we've heard from each of those politicians is going to work, they're going to work better for some politicians than others. And that's why it's so important to do that homework and, and, and know who they are. Um, and saying, Anne Stafford is saying, um, uh, this is a way of um, those different multiple ways are ways of bringing people to the conversation, in particular those who are unrepresented, gathering information that might not otherwise come forward. Yeah, that's right. I think those kitchen table style conversations are great. You can have people who are there comfortably leading the conversation and others who, um, again, might not always be in the room, might be less um, comfortable to speak up, um, but are there, are present. Um, and there's that sense of community that a politician's being welcomed into a community. Uh, Yvonne saying that Adam appeared to recognise the game of politics and analyse the techniques of persuasion. It's not all about facts on which other parties pretend to argue, but also about the head, heart and affect. Yeah, I really appreciated that that part of what he'd said. Um, and it's certainly something that, um, yeah, a lot of politicians have emphasised with me over the years. There was a piece I wrote, I think, for Arts Hub um, a few weeks ago, um, maybe a month or more ago, actually, called the economic argument against the arts is over, the government lost. Um, and I wrote that after it was exposed, um, that $60 billion uh, underspend in um, uh, the Australian government's overall response to COVID-19. And that was all about, um, you know, we can present all the economic arguments we like. And as John Daly was saying um, from the Grattan Institute, we can quantify the size of the arts economy in so many different ways. Um, but then ultimately um, it is that emotive argument. Oh, thanks, Leah, for posting that, um, that article. There you go. It was the 26th of April. So it was, yes, a couple of months ago now. Doesn't time just collapsed? I really, yeah, that, that was like fairly recently in my mind, but it was already that long ago so there you go um yes so, exactly time has just vanished into who knows what um so yeah but of course to be in a position where you can make a, a hearts and minds argument you already need to have built up that relationship in the first place and so that's about all of us you know um uh, mobilising in our different ways. You know, can you imagine, you know, as Adam was saying about the idea of a big national campaign, and I think that is crucial. Um, and really, if the industry can't get our act together to do that ahead of the next election, there's something wrong. Um, but um, if we also then look at... Um, the numbers of us, um, you know, there's 32 of us here right now, but the numbers of us all over Australia, if we're all building those small relationships, you know, it, it absolutely, you know, adds up into something much, much bigger. Now, let's talk more about Arts Day on the Hill, the role that you can play and how we're going to use this as a, a national um, day of um, advocacy focus that can secure some media impact, um, uh, improve politicians' understanding um, and, uh, and really, you know, begin some momentum. So Kate's saying, I'm still just not sure how best to be involved in all this advocacy as an individual artist, just me not representing an art space or anything. Um, and yeah, that can be, 
um, that can really be the most difficult thing, uh, just thinking as an individual, what can I do? So let's now go to the, um, the handbook, which details all of that um, and then lead towards um, focusing and harnessing all of that on Arts Day on the Hill. Now, I've just shared uh, um, the screen or opened the presentation. Uh, please tell me, are you now seeing on the screen uh, the cover of um, the uh, weekly workshops? Uh, oh, yes, you are. Okay, good. So let's recap where we've been so far. We've talked about um, what our plan um, is, uh, that we want to foster confident, informed advocacy, not just in, a, in an emergency response, but in an ongoing way uh, to really build up our, our advocacy skills together. We started um, a couple of months back looking at what's the state of the arts right now. And then when we add the coronavirus and the um, impact of that, um, it's, um, it is a much less pretty picture. We looked at different approaches to advocacy and how there's different kind of sectors, I guess, of the community, the economy, each other uh, of the sector um, that can be activated in different ways to achieve different things. So as citizens, um, we want to activate people who are, who are, you know, maybe not necessarily connected to the arts, um, um, but who, you know, we have the opportunity to inform their, um, um, you know, we think of, our, you know, everyday citizens as representing typically held beliefs, but sometimes uh, until they're motivated to act, they can be um, maybe a little bit too connected to, um, um, the, you know, certain public institutions and not realising how they serve uh, particular interests. Then, of course, there are reformers who can really lead to and make change, uh, people who work in policy, for example. Um, there's change agents to um, mobilise who might be, uh, you know, uh, could be politicians, could be us. So there's visionary thinkers with an eye to that next level. And then um, advocacy can mobilise rebels who want to change things up, who want to, you know, really significantly, you know, break down the way that current things happen and, and, and think about things very differently. And so with Nava's approach, we look at those in terms of the different things that motivate and focus advocacy for artists, the sector, policymakers, politicians, the media and the public, and the different ways that we can reach them. Um, and there's different activities here along the way in, in our handbook. Um, we've got one that's about nurturing local advocacy. This is a great place to start um, uh, thinking about, you know, how, how do you start to have those small conversations? We talked about um, um, starting to develop an advocacy strategy, if there was a small campaign or something that you wanted to start to work on, uh, thinking about what are the tools to hand, what's the language to use, what are the different ways from letters to actions to meetings to much bigger kinds of things. We've looked a few times at, um, and this requires some zooming in, the, um, the workbook for our series is available on our website for NAVA members. Uh, the series of courses is available free to everyone, but to make sure that we are um, uh, focusing and prioritising on our members, um, this handbook is available for NAVA members only. And of course, NAVA membership starts at just $7.50 a month. Uh, and thank you to Leah for posting that link so that you can see it a lot more clearly um, and um, they um, while we've been updating it monthly that the third one does capture all the first and second um, as well so this one was my very very brief history of arts policy in Australia a very useful primer for before you have any MP meeting um, goes chronologically from um, 1912 to today um, and so it's a good highlight of of um, of, of what the trajectory is. Uh, oh, thank you, Nadia. It was one of the most difficult things I've ever had to put together. I sort of gave myself this challenge of um, trying to get it onto a page. And I thought, yeah, that was misguided. Uh, and then, uh, of course, anytime you have to write fewer things, it's very focusing. Uh, and it's been super useful for me personally, I have to say. So I hope it's, yeah, useful for everyone else. We looked at 
And we went into policy. What is Australia's arts policy at the moment? We don't have a documented one, but we can deduce from the actions of government or the values and principles that they apply. We talked about um, the size and scale of the industry, and we looked at um, the kinds of funding framework that currently exist, but we also looked at international comparisons when Dr. Jackie Bailey joined us uh, and looked at uh, different global comparisons in the COVID-19 response to arts and culture. We've got some activities there about the difficulties of the arts making news. There's some great places to start as an individual advocate uh, to do some of these activities around media analysis, around becoming a source or doing a group activity around um, uh, how you would respond to a journalist um, and, um, you know, how, how you would, um, yeah, have your, have your thinking challenge, becoming a source, knowing the angle, reframing the question as we discussed last week. So all of this, um, all of our work and our focuses have been leading up to Arts Day on the Hill on the 12th of August. And um, uh, we discussed last week, we're opening up um, applications for those of you who are interested in becoming a media spokesperson or an advocate for Arts Day on the Hill, where we will then do an extra uh, session of briefing and training for those who would like to do that. And what's involved in doing that? Well, um, we want to uh, curate a diverse range of media spokespeople from across the country who are going to be happy to speak to the media that day on what, what you see as the key issues for the arts. It could be from your local perspective, from the perspective of your practice, um, but to really, uh, you know, one of the great challenges that NAVA faces as an organisation, even though we're the industry peak body and have been around for, you know, 35, maybe 40 years, um, is that... Um, often um, artists are reluctant to engage with the media because we haven't done this kind of approach and training before. Uh, and so um, we're asking for people who are interested uh, and then uh, it's a very, very simple application process. Um, and then we'll do some extra, an extra session ahead of Arts Down the Hill. Or perhaps you'd like to be an advocate um, for uh, your region or your state, um, which will be all about um, being a focus and encouraging others uh, to contribute. Um, Janita Byrne is asking, have we invited industry captains who are champions of the arts to participate in our advocacy day? Oh yes, so this is a collaboration of not just a whole bunch of organisations in, in, in the arts and across the entire uh, spectrum, um, but something I'm constantly doing in, in, in my work is building those relationships with, with what we call third party advocates. Uh, so it can often be one of the most powerful uh, modes of advocacy when you are hearing from someone else, if you're a politician, you know, hearing from someone from a different industry to talk that up, as we were saying in the chat earlier about sport as well, because then it comes across to that politician as, yeah, this is clearly important. It's not just this person trying to, you know, line their pockets with grant funding, um, which is a yeah, bizarre perception that people have, that, that grant funding is something you can, you know, become lucrative on. Uh, but when someone makes an approach, which is clearly not a direct interest, but it's about being a good citizen, uh, that's hugely important, something that our advocates will, will do, is to encourage those other captains of industry, but, but you know, also other third party advocates as well. Now, I'm just going to scroll back and make sure that I didn't miss anything else that we were talking about and some of the questions that came up. Um, Nadi is saying that um, um, there was a lot of encouragement from Adam for us not to necessarily to go down the path of arguing the economic impact of the arts, perhaps because industries like mining do it better. But also, I feel like arguing the inherent benefit of the arts can still feel wishy-washy. Would love to explore strategies for arguing the inherent benefit of the arts that perhaps use some of the language and tactics of economic arguments. That is a great, uh, a great question, um, Nadia, and is something that um, um, the, the, the way that you've articulated that, that's something I try really, really hard to um, to do through my writing and also through the way that I speak to politicians. So to be able to draw on, um, you know, a statistic, but then give it that, um, 
you know, that, that public uh, example. Nadia, you're very popular today. Um, just noting Michaela's comment there. Um, but I will say we're going to pick up on exactly these questions in our next three weeks because we've just had um, we've had our four-week start on um, arts and issues in the arts. What are we advocating for? We then looked at four weeks on policy or lack thereof and, and, and how does policy change actually happen in terms of that advocacy process. We've just concluded four weeks on the media uh, as a platform for advocacy. How do we access the media? How do we understand the media? Uh, how do we work best with the media? Our next chapter is on political engagement. So now we're going to really start to apply some of the things that we have been talking about and hearing from people whose job it is to engage politically in different ways. So people who um, um, do exactly that, uh, people who um, uh, create uh, those narratives or exploit those narratives or manipulate or um, or, or drive them um, and people who've created um, policy and campaigns but from a political perspective. So understanding the politics is our next section uh, in the NAVA Advocacy Program. Next week, we're going to navigate uh, some of those structures that either facilitate or prevent our access to politicians. And our guest next week is Nicholas Picard, who is Executive Director of Public Affairs at APRA AMCOS. He is also Chair of the Australian Society of Authors, and he is a former advisor to state and, state and federal labor arts ministers. Who knew that would be a tongue twister? Um, Nicholas um, has worked for Tony Burke, Simon Crean, Peter Garrett um, and numerous New South Wales government ministers and he was also working federally um, when the national cultural policy was developed and written, so the big national consultations that happened around that and also the release of that policy. So, but today, uh, Nicholas works as um, uh, one of Australia's most successful um, professional arts lobbyists. He has been successful um, at securing uh, policy and funding successes from both sides of politics um, and is a great explainer of these issues. So that's next week. The week after, uh, insights from the inside. Um, past advocacy for the arts hasn't always been successful. Sometimes it's been quite the opposite. Let's hear what the Liberal Party need to be hearing from us so that they can champion the arts with real policy outcomes. And um, the week after next, we're going to hear from Mark Texter, who is one of the principal directors of Crosby Texter, who are political campaign strategists who have won numerous elections for the Liberal Party in Australia and the Conservative Party in the UK. Um, so th their work is um, public opinion, public perception, uh, how to poll it, how to analyse it, how to understand it, um, how to address it and how to shape it as well. Uh, so that's going to be really interesting to hear from someone whose work um, is, you know, that kind of darker side of the, 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 the machinations of, uh, of, of, of politics and the, and the political process. And then after that, how to plan a meeting with a politician. So by that point, we're just about ready to sit down with a politician. Um, and of course, on the day, you know, some of us will get to do that, you know, online, uh, but there are also lots of social media and other kinds of engagement. Um, but on the 29th of July, we're going to have a conversation with Helen O'Neill. She is the chair of Performing Arts Connections Australia. Uh, she's also a former advisor to Labor Arts Ministers, also at the time of writing the National Cultural Policy Creative Nation. Helen is a former CEO also of the British Council in Australia. She was a um, founder of AMPAG, the Australian Major Performing Arts Group and has had some really, um, yeah, really kind of interesting high-level uh, impacts on the sector across her various roles. Uh, and then the week after will be our week of preparation for Arts Day on the Hill, uh, focusing our, our plans and our messages and then collaborating on national impact. Now, we've got just a couple of minutes left. I'm just going to head over to the chat and see if there are any more questions. Elizabeth Lee is asking, 
is NAVA associated with the Arts Party at all? No, NAVA is not associated with any political party and the Arts Party is also not associated with the arts industry. Uh, they're certainly arts people and they've given themselves a name, the Arts Party, but they are not an industry party and are not associated with nor endorsed by uh, the arts industry. By some coincidence, um, one of the members, of the founding uh, members of the Arts Party, uh, Barry Keldoulis, is a former chair of NAVA, was chair some time before I joined the organisation. Uh, so, um, yeah, we, we, we do often get asked that question, but no, there is no association with the Arts Party or with any political party. Who's got some more questions before we wrap up? <laughs> I'm really hoping that um, uh, everyone is going to be involved in some way with Arts Day on the Hill, whether it's in a, a you know, very active way as an advocate or as a media spokesperson, whether it's uh, amplifying uh, messages online, whether it's simply getting in touch with your MP in the ways that we'll discuss as we go. And um, in the next few weeks, if there's people who um, you think should be part of our conversation, please invite them to come along to the advocacy program. You've all got the links of, of where to connect up. Um, just um, having a look there, Carolyn Phillips is saying, is there a contingency plan for Victorians to participate if we're still outcast due to virus? Caroline, I am a Victorian. Uh, I'm not going anywhere. None of us are going anywhere. Um, Arts Day on the Hill is going to happen uh, online. Uh, it will simply not be possible to plan uh, a trip to Canberra this year. And so uh, it is going to be possible for all of us to participate, uh, the maximum number for really, you know, a, a great um, uh, intensity um, and, and that great critical mass. So it is time to wrap up. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, such a great discussion today um, and really generous, I think, of Adam to just uh, yeah cover those issues and just be so clear and, and, and direct and fantastic. Please stay safe everywhere that you are. Those of us in Victoria, keep finding those ways to you know, keep connected with each other. Um, people talk about social distancing. Um, it's social cohesion is so important at this time. Yes, we're physically distant, um, but we are socially connected and very, very importantly. Jacinta saying she can go to Canberra. Unfortunately, um, Jacinta, sorry, Janita, um, Parliament House is closed to the public at the moment. Uh, so there's, there's that as well. Anyway, we will talk more about this in next week and the weeks to come. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Leah. Thank you, Helen, uh, for captioning from Brisbane and see you all next week. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. <laughs>